People are good at jumping to conclusions. We're all good at jumping to conclusions based on what we see. Based on what we see or what we don't see, we immediately know everything about that person, their political affiliation, their personal work ethic, their moral stance. People are good at jumping to conclusions based on what they see. They think they know everything about a person, their upbringing, their, their background, their backstory, where they're from, what side of the tracks they're from, where they're living now, what they do for a living, their contribution to society. And just based on appearances. It's not fair. It's not right to judge someone simply on the basis of what we see. No more fair, no more right than for anyone else to judge us based on what they see about us. Just, just ask the, the one person wearing a mask in a group of people without any masks on. Or the one person at an event where you're supposed to wear a mask, but they don't have one on. They don't like to be judged. Neither, neither of those people like to be judged. Just ask the one person in a conversation about vaccinations who's been vaccinated and no one else has been, no one else would be. Or the one person that hasn't been vaccinated suddenly talking to a group of people that really think you should be. People don't like to be judged, do they? We don't like to be judged. Again, certainly not on the basis of appearances. Don't judge me on how I look, on my fashion sense, my, my hairstyle, my makeup, my piercings, my tattoos. You don't know me. You don't get me. You just think I'm different. Don't judge me on how I spend my money car I choose to drive, the, the home I live in, the vacations I take or don't take, or where I go, the restaurants I frequent, it's really none of your business. It's not any of your concern. Maybe you should just worry about managing your own finances. Don't judge me on my parenting skills, what I allow my children to do, what I forbid my children to do, how I go about disciplining them. I know what's best for them. I know them better than anyone else. And besides, last I checked, you aren't a very good parent because your children are terrible. And please, please, please don't judge me on the basis of my stewardship, how often I come to church, how much I participate in Bible study, how much I volunteer or don't volunteer, how much I serve around the church, what I put in the offering plate, th those things are personal. Those things are between God and me. They're really none of your business. Besides, why don't you kind of work on getting that big, huge plank out of your own eye before you look at that little speck, that little smudge in mine. Now, people don't like to be judged. We don't like to be judged. Have you ever thought that we don't like to be judged because... Sometimes those judgments may just be true. Sometimes those judgments that other people make, whether they're jumping to conclusions or not, might just be accurate. Maybe we don't like to be judged because those judgments tend to strike a chord or they prick an already guilty conscience. What we're thinking is, yet yeah, please... Please don't judge me, because I've already judged myself. I know all about the idols that I've created in my own heart. My house is full of them. I wish I had more of them. You don't have to judge me for that, they say. I know I don't pray for my children hardly enough, and when I do, it's rarely about faith 
or forgiveness or their relationship with Jesus as I call on the name of the Lord. I know worship and Bible study and home devotion, they should all be a higher priority. I know all too well my, my disdain, my disrespect for those in authority over me, whether it's my, my parents or my teachers or my spiritual leaders or, or someone in government. And I know, I know the problems that causes in my family life and the hurdles, the barriers it puts in front of my education, and the challenges it places in my spiritual life, and the frustration it causes me day in and day out as I live in society. Don't judge me on those. I've already judged myself, we say. We know the anger we harbor in our heart against that one person, the resentment that resides there, the evil we wish, and even the revenge we plot. We know how quickly our eyes wander and how long they stare at another human being so lustfully. Don't judge me, we say. Don't, Don't judge me about how envious I appear to be or jealous. Don't judge me because maybe you get it too, how frustrating it is to do all the right things, to work so hard to do all you can to get ahead. And you look at other people and you're doing more than they are, but they have so much more than you. It becomes discouraging. Don't judge me for that. How how much we like to pour the tea or share the dish. The gossip, the slander that rolls off our tongues, off our lips, out of our mouths. How quick we are to betray a trust, a confidence, a secret. Don't judge me. Please. God, please. Don't judge me. I know my guilt all too well. My sin condemns me. I could never stand before you, Lord. What a prayer. What a faith-filled, repentant prayer. A prayer that we have every right to pray. A prayer that we have every right to pray because of Jesus. A prayer that God the Father heard long before that prayer ever left our lips or even our hearts. A prayer that he answered in eternity prayer that he answered in love and compassion and grace and mercy. A substitute. A scapegoat. A whipping boy. A prayer answered in Jesus. Accuse him. Condemn him. Punish him. Granted, a trial would be needed. Charges would need to be leveled. Accusations would be, need to be presented. Evidence would have to be shared. A judgment would need to be made. Sentencing would have to come down. Justice would need to be served. Suffering, pain, separation, death, might we call that hell? Dear Christian, that all happened already. All of that happened already on a Friday long, long ago. Little did the Roman emperor know that the entire world was actually on trial in his courtroom that day in that one man who was standing there silent Alone, the one man who would be whipped and beaten, the one man who would be nailed to the cross, the one who would be lifted up, the one, the one who would hang there and die. Little did he know that God would punish his son in our place. The, the one in whom God would reconcile the world, the one who had no sin, God would make him to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
It was the Lord's will to crush him. We heard that just two weeks ago. The prophet Isaiah, God would make his innocent son a guilt offering. He would suffer for the sins of all. He, in him, would justify many. And today, from the book of Hebrews, Jesus has appeared once for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. It's what the whole Old Testament was about. It's what the whole Old Testament pointed to. All the sacrifices, all the animals, all the blood, the priests, the tabernacle, the temple, the festivals, the holy days, they all pointed to the Lamb, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. All of those things in the Old Testament, all the blood, all the sacrifices, they were just types, just copies. They were just representations. They were just shadows of the reality. The reality is found in Christ. So no more animals, no more goats, no more sheep, no more lambs. No more rams, no more oxen, no more blood of animals, no more shadows, no more types, no more pictures, because the reality is found in Christ Jesus. He appeared once for all to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. He arrived on the scene to carry out everything that his father had determined in eternity was necessary to save the world, to save you, to save me from sin. The good shepherd would become the perfect sheep. The high priest would become the lowly sacrifice. He would be whipped, he'd be beaten. He'd stand before Pilate, he'd lean on the whipping post, he'd crawl out to Golgotha, he'd be lifted up on Calvary, not... Not to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. No, one time, once for all. His sacrifice, himself, his sinless flesh, his holy blood, full, complete, sufficient, accomplished, paid in full. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. The only way he could have done that is if the Father had accepted his payment for our sin. The resurrection guarantees it. The descent into hell assures it. His ascension to to the right hand of God the Father proves it. Jesus is there at the right hand of his heavenly Father appearing for us in God's presence. Our living Savior, our loving mediator, speaking to the Father in our defense, a go-between. And what's he saying there to his Father on our behalf at his right hand? Don't judge them. Father, this is what we talked about. This is what we determined to do. Don't judge them, judge me. Don't judge their hearts, their thoughts, their words, their actions. Judge mine. That's why I came, to live in their place. Judge my heart. Judge my thoughts. Judge my words. Judge my actions. Credit them, Father, with the righteousness that's not their own, but rather credit them with the righteousness I I freely give them, that I won for them, that I earned for them. The one who is doing that, the one who's saying those things, even as we speak here, he's speaking there. The one who's saying that, who's speaking to the Father in our defense, who's pleading our case on his behalf, is coming back. 
He's not coming back to condemn us. He's coming back to bring salvation. He's not coming back to say, oh, guys, how could you? Shame on you. He's not coming back to say, how dare you? He's not coming back to say, I told you so. He's coming back to those who are waiting for him. Those who are waiting for him to say, I love you. He's coming back to say to those who are waiting for him, I forgive you. Those who are waiting for him to to say, put this on your head. It's a crown. The crown of eternal life. Here, wear wear this too. It's a robe. It's the robe of my righteousness. Wear it forever. Never take it off. Jesus is coming back to bring salvation to those who are, are waiting for him. For those who are waiting for him to say, here, sit here. It's a banquet table. It's a heavenly banquet table. An eternal feast. You never have to get up to to say to you and to me who are waiting for him, here, live here. It's my father's house. It's my father's mansion, but there's a room for you, for each of you, for every one of you who believe in me. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to bring salvation. The only judgment he'll say to you or to me that day is one he'll say with love in his heart and a smile on his face. Not guilty. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now confess.